straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. More women testified they were allegedly raped by Danny Masterson as a judge is deciding if there's enough evidence for the That 70s actor to stand trial. Prosecutors played key surveillance video in the trial of an Iowa farm worker accused of murdering a college student and leaving her body in a cornfield. Is a blurry figure Molly Tibbetts out jogging before she was killed? He said, I think I saw something there. I thought he was kidding at first. Plus, did real estate heir Robert Durst kill his best friend Susan Berman because she knew too much about the disappearance of his first wife? Gunshot wound to head. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. More women accusing Danny Masterson of rape are taking the stand at a preliminary hearing. Though that 70s show actor is denying criminal allegations, he attacked three women in the early 2000s. Mr. Masterson, did you sign this form, sir? Yes, sir. Actor Danny Masterson is pleading not guilty to three charges of rape in Los Angeles. At a preliminary court hearing, one of his accusers described waking up to find Masterson assaulting her. Jane Doe No. 1 was identified in court as Christina B. She says in November 2001, she had been dating the actor for five years. That's when she says she tried pulling his hair to get him off of her, but he hit her across the face and spat on her. She described a second incident one month later when she says she woke up and realized she had been anally raped by Masterson in her sleep. Masterson is only charged with the first incident. Masterson's defense played Christina B's police interview during cross-examination. When asked by a police detective if Masterson was trying to have sex with her, Christina B responded yes. Christina B came forward publicly in 2017, speaking with actor Leah Remini on her A&E show Scientology and the Aftermath. We wanted to show you a wide range of abusive policies in hopes that that would be enough for the authorities to step in, and that didn't happen. Remini is a former member of the Church of Scientology turned vocal critic. All three accusers will testify during the four-day probable cause hearing. Masterson is out of jail on a $3.3 million bond. Joining us today is editor and publisher of CrimeStory.com, Carrie Antholis. Carrie, give us a bit of an overview. How's it looking for Masterson in this hearing? Well, I think everyone expects that the judge, Charlene Almeida, is going to allow this trial to go forward. I don't think there's much... Uh, I, I, I haven't heard much skepticism about that. Um, but I think this is an opportunity for Mr. Mesereau to prod the witnesses, the, vi the alleged victims in this case, to see where he can find inconsistencies, where he can find little flaws in their stories and try to uh, attack them now, but also hold some of his powder to attack them uh, at a and ultimately at a trial. So kind of a testing of the waters here and maybe probing into some yeah. areas a little bit more than others. All right, Carrie, let's bring in co-host Terry Austin. Terry, there's a possible sentence of life in prison for Masterson. With as strong as the case seems to be, do you see this as a, a plea type of case or a trial case? You know, the evidence seems very strong so far, Brian. And I think the sooner you take a plea, the better your chances of getting a better deal before the prosecution has to spend so much time and money. But the strength of this case really is the alleged victims. They have strong testimony. They seem to be fairly consistent. When there is an inconsistency, it's explained rather easily. So I definitely think that if you're looking at the ultimate sentence, you might want to consider taking a plea. So I think it's a very strong case so far. Now, Carrie, you kind of touched on this a little. I want you to kind of expand a little uh, that the defense might be testing the waters here, but they pointed to some of the inconsistencies in the alleged victim's reporting. Did that seem persuasive to you at all? Well, what's interesting about that, Brian, is that it opens the door for the prosecution to bring in the Church of Scientology and the practices of the Church of Scientology. Now, the judge, Judge Charlene Almeida, has made very clear that the church is not on trial in this case. However, the practices of the church that coerced, that, um, that, that manipulated, that allegedly manipulated these witnesses to give, to submit particular kinds of reports, that's what's 
That's what's behind a lot of the questioning and a lot of the positioning of the prosecution in this case and their preparation of these witnesses for why they filed inconsistent reports. Makes sense. The church is definitely not on the stand or not being charged with anything, but they are in many ways kind of behind the curtain for many of these cross-examinations and many of these allegations. Thank you both. Now to an update to a story we told you about yesterday. An 11-year-old is speaking out after escaping an alleged kidnapping. Will I die today? Will I get to live the rest of my life? The young girl describing to ABC News when a man reportedly tried to abduct her from her bus stop in Florida. The local sheriff's office released this video showing a man with a knife grabbing Alyssa. Alyssa fought back and the suspect drove away. The local sheriff says Alyssa helped investigators identify her would-be kidnapper by smearing the blue slime she was playing with over the man's arm. The suspect, when we caught him, had blue slime all over his own arms. Alyssa's mother telling ABC News Alyssa learned that tip from a popular TV show. We watch the show's Law & Order Special Victims Unit, and one thing is in them shows they're always talking about how um, you can, if they would have left evidence. 30-year-old Jared Stagna is facing charges of attempted kidnapping, aggravated assault, and battery. And now in Virginia, a sheriff's deputy is being commended for lifting a car off a woman, saving her life. When our Gloucester, it's flipped upside down. Deputy Jay Holt arrived on the scene of a flipped over vehicle and swiftly jumped into action. Body camera footage shows a woman outside the vehicle crying, a child inside crying, and another woman pinned under the car through the sunroof. Mommy! Mommy! The deputy went into overdrive, getting the child to safety and lifting the car enough so the woman could get her head out from between the ground and sunroof. This was not Holt's first heroic act of his policing career. In March 2020, he rescued two people from a burning house. Definitely thankful for his quick heroics and his strength in that incident. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, was Susan Berman shot in the head execution style by Robert Durst? But first, surveillance video of what the prosecution says is the last time Molly Tibbetts is seen alive out for a job. The evidence and much more in the Iowa trial of her alleged killer next. Welcome back to Detectives on the Molly Tibbetts murder case. Take the stand and testify about what led them to the defendant, Christian Bahena Rivera. Law and Crimes' Anjanette Levy is in Davenport, Iowa, where the trial is underway. Investigators say that surveillance video was the key in identifying Christian Bahena Rivera as a suspect. This is difficult to see. Would you agree with me? I would very much agree. If you blink, you'll miss it. It's a silhouette of someone running past a house. Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation agent Derek Reeson collected surveillance video from around Brooklyn, Iowa in the search for Molly Tibbetts. He examined video along Tibbetts' running route. Agent George, he came up and he had asked me what I was looking at. Um, as I'm reviewing the cameras, I show him what I'm looking for. I turned actually to say something to him and he said, I think I saw something there. I thought he was kidding at first. Reeson also noticed a black Chevy Malibu with chrome mirror covers and door handles in the video circling the area. Powasheet County Sheriff's Deputy Steve Kivy told jurors he noticed a similar vehicle and followed the driver. Kivy said he spoke with the driver, who was Christian Bahena Rivera, with the help of a neighbor and then took photos. We'll start with the interaction with uh, Mr. Bahena. When you talked to him that day, describe his demeanor, please. He was, seemed calm and not nervous and... He was polite? Yes. He answered all your questions? He did. Produced all information you requested of him? He did. The detectives were also questioned about how they looked into other potential suspects, including two men who lived in the area who had a history of violence against women. For Law and Crime Daily in Davenport, Iowa, I'm Anjanette Levy. Thanks, Anjanette. Let's bring in publisher of CrimeStory.com, Carrie Antholis and Terry Austin. 
Terry, if you blink, you miss it, is absolutely right with both the car and the jogging of Molly Tibbetts. Do you think the jury will see what they need to in order to get to their conclusion for the prosecution? Brian, you better believe those jurors are not blinking. They want to see proof that that was, in fact, Molly jogging down that road. And I think that video, coupled with the testimony of Christina Stewart, remember, she's the hairdresser, and she saw Molly jogging right before all of this occurred. So I think those two things together will lead the jury to understand that that was, in fact, Molly. And the video of the cars, I think that is really critical. And Agent Reason actually testified that in that short span of time, 14 vehicles were seen on those cameras, and six of those images were of the Chevy Malibu. So I think those videos are going to play a big part in this case. Carrie, when I look at a lot of these cases, I think of it as a public defender. Uh, and so I see, all right, the car is maybe questionable. This is maybe questionable. But at the ultimate and the end of the day, he led her, he led them, sorry, to her body. Are all these just arguments that's going to fly in the wind to that ultimate fact that he led them to her body? Uh, I think so, Brian. Um, it's, you know, what's really fascinating to me about this case is what the jury's not hearing, you know, because he was not properly Mirandized. There's a lot of other information about what he told the police that is not going before the jury. But the fact that he led them to a body in a cornfield that was, you know, that, that where nothing was visible, pretty, pretty, difficult for the defense to overcome, I think. Yeah. Now, Terry, was this an impactful time in the jury when this video was presented? Do you think that the jury really grasped it as much as they should? Absolutely. I think they were focused on it very much so, because they actually want to have something to hang their hat on. This is real credible evidence. It's video of the car. It's a possible video of her. I mean, we know there weren't that many people jogging, so I definitely think this is going to be convincing. And I do think the jury's paying very close attention. Yeah, of course, it's circumstantial evidence, but strong circumstantial evidence can really help in a case like this where they need to connect those dots. Thank you both. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, into the courtroom for the Robert Durst trial, how prosecutors are trying to tie the disappearance of the real estate heir's first wife to the murder of his best friend. Welcome back. We're continuing our coverage of the Robert Durst trial. The millionaire real estate heir accused of murdering his best friend in 2000. Prosecutors say Durst shot Berman because she knew information about the disappearance of Durst's first wife, Kathy, in 1982. Berman allegedly called the dean of Kathy's medical school, pretending to be Kathy, to say she wouldn't be coming in for her first day of rotations. Kathy's would-be supervisor testified that it was unusual for the dean to receive the call and not herself. They would be responsible to call their local supervisor or their local supervisor's office, and that would have been me. And at that time, were students in advance? Did they know, in other words, did Kathy Durst, would she have known that she was going to be starting this uh, rotation in advance, would that have been something that they would have just told her that morning when she showed up? Oh, no, they would have told her in advance. I mean, these things are carefully planned months in advance uh, for all the students. The, the location of Albert Einstein Medical School relative to 1982 was not a safe area to be in. It's, first of all, it's in the Northeast Bronx, okay. sir, and not in the South Bronx. Uh, my apologies. And I would take issue with that. Let's bring publisher for CrimeStory.com, Carrie Antholis, and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, there are small oddities in the case, like the call to the dean, but are these oddities adding up to Durst being guilty? You know, that call is very interesting, Brian. I think that it is making a good point here. You heard several witnesses testify, the friends and classmates of Kathy, and also, you know, the supervisor there, saying that you would not report an absence, you wouldn't call the dean of the school, you'd call the supervisor, or you would have planned it ahead of time. And so I do think that the jury could conclude that Durst put Berman up to making that call, and that the voice was different, 
So I believe that they are making a big deal about this call because it could very well support their case that, you know, this was a ruse and that Durst was really trying to cover something up here. Absolutely. Now, Kerry, you're the host of CrimeStory.com's Jury Duty, the trial of Robert Durst, and you've been following this case for the last seven years. What was the most striking thing to you in the restart of the trial? The most striking thing to me, Brian, was that the prosecution at the beginning of their opening statement said the following words. Robert Durst, on three separate occasions, said that the person who wrote the anonymous note notifying the Beverly Hills police of a cadaver at Susan Berman's address was the murderer, had to be the person that killed or was involved in the murder of Susan Berman. He said that three different times, and he denied being the author of that note. And then, just last year, his lawyers stipulated that, in fact, he was in Los Angeles on that day, and he did write that note and send it to the Beverly Hills police. That, to me, is the most striking and difficult thing for the defense to overcome. Yeah, difficult, but also they created that hill that they've got to climb. I don't understand why they would do that. You always try to remove obstacles from yourself as a defense attorney, but maybe this is a hill that they're willing to climb and can climb. But well, of course, we'll check it out and watch it as you have gavel to gavel coverage of the Law and Crime Network. When we come back, testimony continues from the Robert Durst trial, the key moments as officers found Susan Berman's body, and why defense attorneys are taking aim with the investigation. Next. Back to testimony in the trial of the millionaire real estate heir accused of murdering his best friend, where defense attorneys cross examined the officer who discovered Susan Berman's body in 2000. At the time after you discovered the body, none of you wore protective gear after the body was discovered, did you? No, we did not. Okay. Did you do anything or did you see anybody do anything to secure the phone to see whether or not there were fingerprints on the phone? No, when I went in there, the phone was off the hook and we just left it there. Nobody even bothered to mark this as a potential source of evidence, did they? I don't see a number there, so I don't, somebody took the picture, but I do not see uh, evidence number where the other one had the one by it. What, why is it you didn't put on some booties before you went inside? Well, number one, there, we don't get them issued, and number two, I didn't think it was going to be a homicide scene, so there was that thought never occurred to me. After the discovery, the Los Angeles medical examiner searched her body for clues. On direct examination, he noted how close the shooter must have been to Berman's body at the time of her death. Assuming it's a nine millimeter, then we're talking about within an inch, probably closer, probably half inch to contact itself. All right. So are you telling this jury? that whatever weapon, assuming it was a nine millimeter, caused that wound that you're looking at in this exhibit, when it was fired, the muzzle of that gun was either pressed up against the back of the head or within an inch? That is correct. Do you have any doubt whatsoever about that? No, I do not. What about the fact that there's no soot or stippling in that wound? Does that affect your opinion? Not at all. On cross, the defense asked the medical examiner to estimate what time Susan Berman would have died at based on the stiffening of her body, known as rigor mortis. Before it's gone, again, we're talking about it starts to dissipate between 18 and 36 hours. So 18 hours is one of the earliest that it can be gone. Okay. So we know that from uh, assuming that he was correct, that there was no rigor mortis, Susan Berman must have died at least 18 hours earlier and as much as 36 hours? And beyond. Remember, once it's gone, it could be beyond that time period. Okay. So two days before, three days before. One thing that determines or uh, is influential on how fast rigor mortis goes away is the temperature of the room in which the body is, right? Absolutely. Did you find any place where the police or the investigator uh, took the temperature of the room. No. 
Carrie, the defense made a big deal about the lack of forensic tying Durst to the scene, but as you pointed out, actually, he admits to being there, so why is there no evidence of him being at that scene, him being Durst? Well, I, that's going to be for the jury to speculate on or to come to a conclusion on. In my opinion, it speaks to the fact that he was, a, when he discovered her body, if he did discover her body, he was concerned that suspicion would fall on him, and he cleaned up his tracks to make it look like he wasn't there. By contrast, if the allegations prove true, then he was he cleaned up the scene to make sure there was no evidence that Robert Durst was there, except he also wrote that cadaver note because he cared, uh, presumably, and uh, according to the prosecution, because he cared enough about Susan Berman that he didn't want her body to decompose and his, for her dogs to be left unattended. That's some contradictory information. We'll see how that plays out in the jury. Terry, in the testimony of the medical examiner, what about how she died is telling the jury who killed her? You know, I think it's interesting. The medical examiner talked about the cause of manner of death. He said, obviously, it was a gunshot wound to the head and that it was homicide. But it doesn't really give the jury information about who did it. There was, as we've just said, there was no forensic evidence at the scene. So the jury could really be left speculating. And as a matter of fact, the defense could say that it was something else like mafia related. Absolutely. Make sure to check out the case on the Law and Crime Daily. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.